Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Jim Knoll. I'm the Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association Star Party Manager. And welcome to our virtual star party. All right, so here we, uh, here we are with uh, the current position of the planets for June. And if you look, uh, you can kind of see Earth uh, up here. Mercury's right in line uh, with us in the sun. So it's actually down behind our, it's gonna be in the glare of the sun. Uh, Venus is pretty close to the sun, so it's probably not going to be visible, very visible. Uh, Mars is right out here, and it's, uh, it's in good shape. It's uh, going to be in the western sky. And as we zoom out, you can see there's Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, they'll be up uh, pretty late. Jupiter rises, uh, let's see, Jupiter rises around midnight and Saturn about 11 p.m. Arizona time. So uh, those are going to be uh, pretty late objects. And then if we keep going out, we've got Uranus, Neptune, and then poor little Pluto out here. Pluto was demoted uh, oh, several years ago to a dwarf planet. And as you can see, if you compare the orbits of the other planets, to Pluto, you can see that it's a little bit elongated, a little bit different. And then if we start looking at the view uh, from the edge, then you can really see a difference between the main planets and Pluto. Most of the planets orbit in the same plane as the, uh, as the sun, whereas Pluto <clears throat> is often uh, in a slightly different elliptical orbit. So Pluto, they think, is probably the one of the larger objects and uh, one of the ones we've seen uh, at the closest one for the Kuiper Belt. So the Kuiper Belt is uh, just kind of a belt of leftover stuff from the solar system formation beyond Pluto. And Pluto is just one of the Kuiper Belt objects. Once we get the James Webb Telescope uh, up later this year, then hopefully uh, they'll be able to start finding some more uh, really cool stuff out in the uh, out in the Kuiper Belt. So let's, uh, and then right now in the night sky, um, here is our current view of the night sky. Um, and if you, uh, if you look evening, uh, you know, after dark or so, if you look down towards the southeast, southeast you can see Scorpius right down here. Uh, it, it's one of the few constellations that actually does look like a scorpion. Uh, straight overhead, pretty much, is going to be Virgo, Virgo the Maiden, um, and it'll be pretty much straight up. And there's a lot of things, and we'll probably look at some of those uh, at some point in time. And then off towards the west, just west of Virgo, you can see Leo the Lion. You can see the lion outlined here. Um, Leo is actually kind of easy to find in the night sky, at least the main, because um, what you can look for is you look for a backwards question mark right in here. So kind of look straight up and you'll see a backwards question mark. This bright star right here is uh, Regulus. And then this is the name of the line. And then the rest of the line right now is kind of pointing towards the east. Uh, and then looking up towards the uh, north, you can see Ursa Major, which is the big bear. That's this guy right here. Uh, part of the big bear is, is the Big Dipper. So you can see the handle of the Big Dipper right here, which is the tail of the bear. And then the bucket is kind of the main part of the torso. And then his legs come off the, the lower end of the bucket stars. And then it, there's kind of a faint star out here that denotes his head and it kind of stretches out. Um, the cool thing about the Big Dipper is it can, you can use it to actually help you find the North Star and the Little Dipper. So if you go off these two end stars right here of the bucket, They'll point right towards Polaris. Polaris will be the bright star that's out here. And that's the end of the handle of the Little Dipper and of the Little Bear. Here's the outline of the bear. It's a little bit hard to see because it's kind of crowded in there. The handle for uh, Ursa Minor, the Little Bear is, uh, the handle of the Little Dipper is part of Ursa Minor, it's the tail. And then the bucket part is right in here. Most people can only see Polaris and maybe these two end stars. If you can see the other stars in the handle and the little dipper, then you've got actually some pretty good, pretty good skies. Now, one of the things we're going to talk about tonight is we're going to uh, take a look at uh, several different kinds of galaxies. And so I wanted to make sure 
that you guys could uh, had a little idea of what they're all about. So there's basically three main types of uh, galaxies. There's spiral galaxies, elliptical galaxies, and then what we call irregular galaxies. We'll look probably look at several spiral galaxies. They're really cool because they have some very well-defined um, spiral arms, a nice clear nucleus in the center, uh, very pretty to look at. The, uh, they're also kind of medium-sized, so to somewhat large, but mostly medium-sized galaxies. You can they can be small to you know to only a few billion stars to maybe several hundred billion stars. Our Milky Way galaxy is a spiral galaxy, probably looks very similar to this, as is the Andromeda galaxy, which is the other large galaxy near us. Then we have elliptical galaxies. <clears throat> elliptical galaxies, they think, are kind of the result of maybe mergers of lots of other galaxies to include spiral galaxies. And they basically just kind of get all jumbled up into a big ball. So they don't have the defined structure that you would see in a spiral galaxy, um, but you have just kind of a ball. They're huge. They can have upwards of trillions of stars because they've, they've been formed by a lot of mergers of previous galaxies. The thought, the current thought right now is uh, the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy would probably merge together in four to five billion years. When we do, we might form an elliptical galaxy because it'll just kind of take the, all the spiral arms and jumble everything up. And we have irregular galaxies, and there's a couple of types. Um, there's ones that are called lenticular galaxies, so they kind of kind of stretched out. Um, not uh, you know some they they could some of them could be spiral galaxies that we're just seeing the edge on. Uh, some of them aren't, but right in here you can see, and this is called the sombrero galaxy because it kind of looks like a sombrero hat. This would be the brim of the hat with the top and bottom part of the hat. So that's uh, one type of galaxy of irregular galaxy. And then another one, uh, type two one, is when, when two galaxies collide. So when they're first starting to merge, they might stretch each other out and do some weird things to the stars and the dust and the gas. And, uh, and, and that makes them just look kind of irregular. And that's, this is the picture here is the antenna galaxy. And then the other thing that we're going to look a little bit at tonight is uh, the kind of the stars, the evolution of stars. Uh, all the stars generally start with a uh, out of a cloud of cold hydrogen gas. The smaller stars, like our sun, will eventually they'll in the when they're on the main sequence they'll last for you know ten billion years on average or so, and then when they get towards the end of their life, they will start puffing off their uh, their gas and they kind of expand out into what's called a red giant. So. They'll get a lot bigger, but they're also a lot more diffuse and, and you know, the, the mass is still the same. They're just larger. And then eventually they'll puff off their outer uh, gas. And that's what you see coming off of here. And that we call a planetary nebula. And then finally, uh, what will be left will be kind of the core of the star. And that's a white dwarf. So this will be the, the fate of the sun in a long, long time. We don't have to worry about it for any time soon. It's going to be at least uh, another four or five billion years, a long ways. And then the larger stars, uh, like uh, um, Betelgeuse uh, and some of those, will become red supergiants. So they'll start off on their main sequence, but they may only last for millions of years, not billions of years. And then they become a red supergiant. So it's similar to a red giant, just much, much larger. And then finally, um, <clears throat> they will explode and become a supernova. And we'll, uh, sometimes we can look at uh, supernova remnants, and that's the gas that has expanded off of this, these red giant, super giants after they've exploded. And then uh, they'll either become a neutron star, so they're just kind of a, a big, a, they're much, much smaller than what they were before, and they're just very dense neutrons. Or if they're really big, then they could become condensed down into a, a stellar mass black hole. So this isn't the super massive black holes that we have in the center of the galaxy, uh, but these are more stellar or star sized black holes. So we'll see some of those kinds of objects probably over, over tonight as well. All right, the last thing I wanna briefly mention before we get into doing some observing is a little bit on astronomy terms. Um, throughout the program, you'll hear us refer to object as a Messier or M number. 
<clears throat> Those are objects that were uh, recorded by Charles Messier back in the 1700s as he was looking for comets. And uh, he noticed these things didn't move, but they kind of looked like comets because they were fuzzy. And so he chose to record them so that he wouldn't confuse them with future observations. And they've now become some of the best objects for amateurs to view. Well, also uh, another large catalog that we uh, use is the New General Catalog or NGC. So you'll hear us refer to NGC numbers as well. Um, you will talk a little bit about magnitudes. The lower the number, the brighter the object. Normally a magnitude six or a little lower than that, maybe a five is a uh, naked eye. So that means it's something you can see with your naked eye. If it's a higher number than six, then you probably need a telescope or binoculars. And then finally, uh, a light year. <clears throat> light year is a distance that light travels in one year. So at 186,000 miles per second, that's about 6 trillion miles per year or about 9.4, 9.5 trillion kilometers. It's, uh, so we use this to measure distance between objects. Now what we're gonna do is take a look at some of the astronomy equipment. We'll start off with Jim O'Connor. Jim. Thanks, Jim. Uh, what you're seeing in front of there is exactly where I'm sitting right now, except it's uh, nicely a bit darker. Uh, my equipment is, starts out with a 10-inch schmidt cassegrain telescope. It, but rather than using an eyepiece in it, I've put a, a video camera on the back end. That telescope, and you can see it farther away on the left and up close and personal on the right, uh, it's a very old one. It's almost 30 years old, so I've got a new rather newer mount it's on, the thing that holds it up and, and lets it move around the sky. It's a Celestron AVX equatorial mount. So it's a 10-inch Schmidt grass grain telescope on an equatorial mount. Uh, the camera is called a Mellencam and Terminator. It's got a high sensitivity CCD. It's one of the highest sensitivity uh, video chips uh, in the world, uh, but it's small. It's only a quarter of an inch on a side, that chip. So it's only got 377,000 pixels. So it does not give you a whole lot of grabbing of light, but it can go a long way away and grab it. It's in full color and it's got a thermoelectric cooler on the inside. And that's what the, if you look closer at the, closely at the camera, you see these big fans on the outside. That's keeping it cool. But that whole setup is what I use when I go out and show things. And if you look in the left-hand picture, there is a uh, monitor on a stand. That monitor is what I use uh, for public uh, viewing because more people can see what I'm looking at and then I know what they're seeing. Jim? Okay, thank you. And now over to Rick. You'll see that my scope is of a different design than, than Jim's. Uh, mine is a refractor telescope uses uh, lenses rather than mirrors. It's a four inch uh, stellar view uh, refractor on a uh, very large uh, Losmandy G11 mount. It gives me very good stability for imaging. Uh, and I'm running an ASI 2600 color uh, cooled camera. Uh, the sensor inside this camera has been specially adapted for this service, but it's very similar to what you would find inside a, a modern uh, digital uh, SLR camera. All right, thanks, Rick and Bernie. Hi, everyone. I'm Bernie Stinger, and welcome to the Grand Canyon Star Party. I'm presently out at our dark sky site in the Chiricahua Mountains, about 100 miles southeast of Tucson. And at that site, we have several permanent peer telescopes. One of them is the one I'll be using this evening which is a nine inch folded refractor. And it's mounted onto this uh, heavy duty astrophysics mount. Now all of the, uh, the camera control and everything is coming back that big black wire on the left side back into the control room, which is the white building in the upper left corner. And that's where I'm sitting right now uh, controlling the camera 
and what we'll be looking at this evening. Uh, the camera I'm using is a Mellencam DS432C. It's a color camera, it's a CMOS camera, and it's very sensitive to light. Uh, some of the objects we'll be looking at tonight are very, very faint. Uh, so I'm using my most sensitive camera. Back to you, Jim. All right, so that's kind of just a quick overview of the equipment. So now let's get on to some deep sky observing. My next object is what's called the ghost of Jupiter. It's a planetary nebula in the constellation Hydra. It also goes by the name of Caldwell 59. Not sure exactly why they call it the ghost of Jupiter. I've heard some say that it's about the same size as Jupiter uh, in the sky, but I don't really see it looking like Jupiter. So I'm not sure where that name came from. It's also known as the eyeball nebula. And that is far more apparent. It's about 5,000 light years away. And it was discovered by William Herschel in 1785. Now why this didn't got, get on the Messier catalog, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, it should have been bright enough for Messier to see, but he might have just missed it. It's also called the Diamond Nebula, or others have called it the CBS Nebula, all of which uh, are very possible. Uh, it does kind of have the shape of a, a, an eyeball. It has the shape of a, um, somewhat of a diamond. Um, and it does also have kind of the appearance of the, the CBS logo. It does have a beautiful central star uh, that's the cause for these uh, nebulous shells. Um, and uh, it has uh, two apparent shells as well. So an outer shell and an inner shell, which means that most likely this star uh, has exploded more than once. Uh, the outer shell being uh, an older shell than the inner shell did or does. The, the central star is a white, white dwarf star. And it's created this nebula, which is about two light years wide. So think of the distance from our star, our star the sun, to our nearest neighbor, which is Alpha Centauri. That's a little over four light years. So being two light years wide means that this nebula is almost half the distance between our sun and our closest star, Alpha Centauri. So this is a huge, huge nebula in the sky. It, it's about 1,500 years old. Now, when you look for this in a telescope, most people see this out, this inner one fairly easily. The outer nebula is much more difficult to visually see and typically is only seen by using a camera as we are tonight. So this is the ghost of Jupiter. This object is known as Messier 44. It's an open cluster. Its modern name is known as the Beehive Cluster. It's up in the constellation Cancer. This cluster has been known since ancient times. This is not any kind of a recent discovery. It's also one of the nearest open clusters to our solar system. It's only about 610 light years away. It's very close. Um, it's very visible to, 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 to the naked eye. That's one of the reasons it was discovered so long ago. 
um, it was mentioned by the Greek poet Aratos, uh, mentioned it uh, in 260 BC. Um, it was also included in a star catalog in 130 BC. Uh, lots of ancient civilizations had uh, stories around this star cluster because it was so, so, so visible. The Greeks and Romans saw this cluster as a manger from which two, two donkeys uh, are, are eating. Um, and it was these donkeys on which uh, two of the gods rode into battle against the Titans. So they had those kind of stories are around it. Um, the ancient Chinese saw this nebulous object as a ghost or a demon riding in a carriage and likened its appearance to a cloud of pollen blown from willows. Very, very poetic phrase there for this. Um, and although this was not a, a new discovery and known for quite some time, Charles Messier did add it to his uh, catalog as the 44th object in his catalog on March 4th, 1769. Uh, they, they actually thought it was kind of curious that he included this object uh, in his catalog, since his catalog was about objects that could be confused as comets, and this was definitely something that was not to be confused as a comet. Um, it was well known and, and well documented, so they were kind of curious uh, that he included it. Um, however, the, the origin of... Uh, the cluster's popular name of the beehive is uncertain. Uh, no one quite knows where, where that one came from. Um, there's about um, 350 uh, stars in this in this total cluster. There's you can see the very bright members there, and a lot of the other stars in this around in this frame are part of the overall overall cluster. Um, overall, they think it contains about um, a thousand stars total. Um, there are some uh, dwarfs in there um, and some uh, stars going across all the classes of stars. Here's another one of Mr. Messier's uh, distinguished uh, or, or uh, uh, interesting objects to look at. Uh, this is M94. It's got a name of the Crocs Eye gal uh, Galaxy. So it's supposed to look like a crocodile's eye. Um, it was actually a spiral galaxy in the constellation Canis Venatici. The dogs again are, are herding dogs. It was actually discovered by Pierre Machane in 1781. Pierre Machane was Charles Messier's partner. They actually worked together as a, as a team to discover these items, remembering they're trying to find comets so that the French Navy can figure out from their superstitions how they should conduct their operations. And uh, they're looking around to try to find these things, and they just happen to find these other beautiful objects to look at. Okay, this object uh, in Canis uh, Venatici. Um, it was found by uh, Machane in 1781, but Charles Messier claimed it for himself two days later when he found it. So it's actually got two uh, people, even though they were partners, they're each claiming uh, uh, credit for it. Um, the intense area around the inner core has got a, an immense star forming region. There's a lot uh, uh, several hundred million stars being formed in that area. And with a crisp enough monitor, there are some dim gray spiral arms coming out from it. They're very difficult to see. It usually takes a long photograph to be able to start picking out the outer arms. But the in, in the middle, it does look like a crocodile's eye staring out at you. So oh, uh, I would avoid this if you were out swimming in his direction. My next object is called the Eskimo Nebula. It's a planetary nebula 
in the constellation Gemini. It's also known by the name NGC 2392. Um, by the way, NGC means New General Catalog. It was a catalog of objects in the sky that was created back in the late 1800s, if I remember right. And there was something like 10,000 objects on it, if I remember. The Eskimo Nebula is also known as the Clown Face Nebula and the Lion Nebula. It's about 6,500 light years away. And you can just see it there is that blue patch. But if I zoom in, it becomes more apparent. Like most planetaries, the central star is quite obvious. Uh, and there's several shells of uh, material that surround uh, the, uh, the central star. Uh, and the Eskimo Nebula is no different. The inner shell is more obvious because it's newer, it's more dense, it hasn't had a chance to uh, spread out into the uh, uh, into space and uh, thin down. The outer shell is much thinner uh, and it's uh, more difficult to see. In a telescope, if you look for this, you'll no doubt see the central star and the inner shell because they're fairly bright. This outer shell is much more difficult to spot. Most of it has a greenish appearance uh, which is indicative of oxygen. However, there are little streaks of browns and reds in the outer shell as well. Um, so a nice colorful nebula to look at. It was discovered by William Herschel in 1787. These little streaks in that outer shell are about a light year long. And the reason it's called an Eskimo nebula is that outer shell with those little streaks in it kind of give the appearance of a face with a parka of fur. And that's why it's called the Eskimo nebula. Of the screen here is known as Messier 60. It is a giant elliptical galaxy located in Virgo. And you'll see right next to it uh, a dimmer galaxy, which is a nearby spiral companion. And the two of them appear to be interlacing between each other. They were both discovered by Johann Kohler in April 1779. Uh, and it was an interesting discovery. He, he actually wasn't looking for this. Um, it was during an observation of a comet that he was looking at that happened to be in the same part of the sky. And that's when he, he noted um, the, the, these objects. Now, you'll also notice above these two, you'll see another bright object towards the upper part of the frame. That is another galaxy, uh, Messier object 59. It's also in this, in this area. So M60, the, the bright one here in the center, it is one of, the, one of the giant elliptical galaxies at the core of what's called the, the Coma Virgo supercluster of galaxies. It's about 65 million light years away and it's got a diameter of about 140,000 light years. This is a big boy. That, that's is about as big as the galaxies can, can, can get. The Hubble Space Telescope has investigated uh, M60. They've done some research with it. And uh, they've looked at its core and found that it contains a massive central object that, of about 2 billion solar masses. That's equivalent of 2 billion of our suns at its core. Uh, 
Photographs obtained with other large telescopes um, also show a large system of about 5,000 um, faint globular clusters around the outside halo of the, of the galaxy. So that is uh, galaxy M60, his little companion, which is NGC 4649, and above it, M59. This object is uh, another open cluster and another one discovered by Charles Messier in Gemini. This is called Messier Object 35 or the Shoebuckle Cluster. It's, uh, it's very large. Uh, we're looking uh, nearly into the center of it. And it's a uh, scattered over an area bigger than a full moon. So uh, that's a pretty large group of stars. Um, it's 3,870 light years away in the constellation Gemini. It's down near the bottom of Gemini, if you know what Gemini looks like, the right-hand side, it's right on the outer edge of the, of the constellation. It's 3,870 light years away, as I said, and its mass in the center by calculation of the velocities is over 1,600 suns inside this cluster. This is one of the most populous open clusters you'll find. Its size, it's about 20 light years across, and it's estimated to be fairly young, only 175 million years old. And it's in uh, Gemini, which is an interesting con constellation because we always think of Castor and Pollux, the two stars at the top of the, of the constellation. But that constellation um, has another meaning. It's the constellation of cattle thieves because that's the family of Castor and Pollux. That's what their business was, rustling cattle. And in fact, Castor, who was uh, mortal while his brother Pollux was immortal as the son of Zeus, um, their family was having a dispute over how to divide the spoils from their last latest cattle raid. And Castor was actually accidentally killed in the str family struggle. So Pollux pleaded with his father Zeus that he share some immortality with his twin brother. And Zeus ended up allowing them both to uh, alternate time up in Mount Olympus. But to do that one day in Olympus and then the next day in Hades uh, and swapping places was, not, was frowned upon by Zeus's wife, Hera. And she went to Zeus and she told him, stop being foolish and just put them up in the sky where they deserve to be. So that's how we get the constellation Gemini. My next object is a comet. This is Comet Palomar, or one of the Palomar comets. The uh, Palomar is a observatory in California that has a number of automated cameras that sweep the sky every night looking for comets. Um, in an automated fashion. And this one was picked up by them last year. Uh, so it's been given the designation 2020 for the year T2. It's in the constellation Keynes Van Edison. And it has a visual magnitude of 12.2. Now at that visual magnitude, uh, it's small and quite difficult to visually spot. You'd never see it. I mean, looking up at the, in the sky, uh, even with binoculars, it would be very difficult. Uh, it requires uh, a telescope of, of at least six inches or, or more. It's 150 million miles distant. And it will be the closest in May of this year when it reaches 131 million miles from the Earth. 
its closest approach to the sun, which also happens in May, is just outside of the orbit of Mars. So really it doesn't get close to the sun at all. That's the closest it gets. And because it's in a, uh, an orbit around the sun, it will come back again in about 6,000 years from now. So if you hang around that long, you can probably spot it again. Visually, it looks a little bit of a fuzzy patch. It has a fairly distinct coma, the central part. Not all comets do, but it has a fairly distinct coma and faint uh, a, a very faint tail probably going to the upper left. That's the way I see it, at least. Looks like uh, uh, it has kind of an arc in the front and then fading off to the upper left. So this is one of many, many comets that circle around the sun on a continual basis. Uh, this one just happens to be bright enough that we can spot it with a telescope. This object in the towards the middle of the screen is Messier Object 88. It's a spiral galaxy in the constellation Coma Berenices. And it's one of the giant uh, spiral members of the Coma Virgo galaxy cluster. It was uh, one of the eight galaxies that Charles Messier discovered on March 18, 1781. Uh, this region is very rich with galaxies, so it's not hard to imagine that he found eight in one sitting. In fact, in this image, you look in the upper uh, left here, that little smudge is a galaxy. There's a galaxy down here. There's two down towards the bottom. Uh, another one over here. So he may not have seen all those, but there's other galaxies in the region. But uh, in this quick image I've taken here, you can see the spiral nature. You can see the some of the arms, see the dark lane right there. And uh, we're, we're seeing this galaxy not quite, um, we're seeing it at kind of at an angle. It's not edge on, it's not face on. We're seeing it at a, at a tilted angle towards us. Uh, this galaxy is about 36 million light years away. Uh, closer than some, but still pretty far away. And it's about uh, 91,000 uh, light years across. So a, a large spiral, not a massive one, but it, it is a large spiral galaxy. And that is Messier 88. As you probably can tell from this galaxy that we're looking at, it's called the Black Eye Galaxy. It's another Messier object, Messier object number 64. And it's in the constellation Coma Berenices. Now, a little bit about that constellation. In Greek, the word for, uh, for hair is coma. And so when you um, talk about a comet, a comet is a hairy star that was named by the Greeks that way. Well, Coma Berenices, was named in honor of a queen of Egypt who was married to Ptolemy III, uh, Queen Berenice. And she went to the oracles and she said that if her husband, the king, Ptolemy III, if the king came back from a battle that he was going away from without injury, she would sacrifice her long, beautiful hair to uh, the oracles for them to give to Zeus for his wife, Hera. Uh, he came back from the battle unharmed. She left the hair there uh, with the oracles, but Zeus said Hera was beautiful enough without it. But he rethought the, uh, uh, the, the attempted gift and he took that, he retook the uh, hair that she had offered and put it in the star. And there is a, 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 a cluster called Mel 111 
that's up there in Coma Berenices that looks like someone's hair. And that's where the name Coma Berenices came from. But this galaxy, as you can see, is one of the many in the Coma cluster. And there is uh, a, a, quite a dustband feature that gives it a look of a black eye. Um, it's also called the Evil Eye Galaxy, and it's uh, an isolated spiral galaxy 17 million light years away in the, uh, in the constellation of Coma Berenices. It was discovered on March, in March uh, 1779 um, by three people all on the same night, but Charles Messier got credit for, uh, for it because he had a more complete uh, description of it. The dark band of absorbing dust is partially in front of a bright nucleus, and that's what gave it the name of black eye or evil eye. This is M13, the 13th object in Messier's list. It's a globular cluster in the constellation Hercules. In fact, they call it the Great Globulum in Hercules for a number of reasons. It's a beautiful globular to look at. It's easily visible in spring and summer. In fact, it's so bright that you can spot it visually without any unaided eye if you know exactly where to look in the constellation of Hercules. It shows up as a little tiny fuzzy patch. And in binoculars, it's a very large fuzzy patch. In a telescope, you can resolve it down to a lot of individual stars. Uh, as you can see in my image here, uh, I've tried to set the exposure uh, so that you can see not only the outer stars, but some of the inner stars in the middle. Like most globulars, we're looking at hundreds of thousands of stars. This globular was discovered by Edmund Holley in 1714. Now, many of the objects we've been talking about so far have been discovered in the late 1700s or early 1800s. You'll notice this one was discovered in 1714. Why? Because it's so bright, it was easily spotted visually without the need of a telescope. It's 22,000 light years distant and it's 84 light years across. Like most, like most globulars, it's also very old. This one is 11 billion years old. This particular globular kind of reminds me <clears throat> of the body of a spider. At least that's what, that's what I see when I look at it. Here's the body. Here's the little antenna sticking out the front. And here's the legs going off in these straight lines. In fact, you can count several legs. So that's what I see when I look at this globular uh, body of a spider. This object is Messier Object 108. It's a barred spiral galaxy located in the constellation Ur Ursa Major, the, the Big Bear, or part of it's known as the Big Dipper. And it's seen almost edge on from our perspective. It was discovered by Pierre Machin around 1782. Pierre was uh, Charles Messier's uh, uh, companion. Um, but it was not officially added to the Messier catalog until the 1950s. That's why it's got a high number. Messier himself did not actually add it to the catalog. It was added by modern astronomers to his catalog. Uh, William Herschel independently rediscovered the object in 1789, and he cat 
cataloged it under his own cataloging system. This um, edge on galaxy is about uh, one degree northwest of the uh, Owl Nebula, which isn't in our frame here. The Owl Nebula is often a, a popular object to, to see also. It's uh, actually uh, surprising how much detail you can see in this galaxy from seeing it edge on, but you can see some of the dark, uh, dark dust lanes from it. Um, it's an isolated member of a Ursa major cluster of, of galaxies. It's about 45 million light years away, and it's moving away from us. It's moving away from us at about 700 uh, kilometers per second. M108 is about 32 million light years away. It's got a diameter of about 37,000 uh, light years. So it's, a, it's on the order of being a, a small spiral galaxy. The object you see here is another globular cluster. This one is Messier's object number 53. A globular cluster really is a tight ball of anywhere from about 10,000 to well over a million very old stars. Um, they have highly elliptical orbits around the uh, Milky Way's core. Uh, they're as much as 100,000 light years away from the core of the galaxy. Um, and the stars in them are older than a majority of the galaxy. So the mystery always is, where do globular clusters come from? Um, there's been some uncertain origins. There were, there were three different theories of how uh, globular clusters have formed, and they had seemed to have come up with the conclusion that all three answers were correct. First, they could be the cores are the centers of very old galaxies, the one among the first galaxies that formed. And that's all that's left from the core. Uh, or there could be two small, uh, two other clusters that were very, very big, and they kind of uh, uh, passed each other and their massive common gravity pulled them together into a single object that is now uh, at high age and circling around the outside of our galaxy. And the third was, well, back after the Big Bang, when the uh, stars first could start to form from the hydrogen gas that was, uh, le that was formed out of the uh, initial creation of the universe, the, um, gal the galaxies or the uh, clusters that would form out of these stars would have been massive. There's nothing to get in the way of their forming, and there's lots of gas. Uh, when those giant clusters formed, then that's what makes a globular cluster, except those are the survivors. So there was a lot of experimenting and a lot of research that went on, oh, probably about 15 years ago, trying to find out some of this information. And it turned out when they looked at uh, something like three out of the first five globular clusters that they checked at Kitt Peak National Observatory, they found out that there was a supermassive black hole at the center of it. Well, what that was, was the fingerprint or almost the license plate of the core of an old galaxy. And so that when the Milky Way formed, the basic stars, not, the, not these old globular clusters or some of, the, some of the bright core stars that are still around, but the basic stars in the Milky Way have an average age of about 7 billion years. These are 11 to 13 billion years. So they were around as small galaxies, and then the Milky Way formed and kind of trapped them. Well, that was only some of the objects they found. They started checking globular clusters around Andromeda and found two different ages. Spectroscopically, they found two different ages in some of the clusters. So that made the collision idea of two smaller open clusters that went together and formed these tight bands. That was another way. And then they were looking at uh, a couple of giant galaxies in the Virgo cluster, and they looked at some of the clusters there, and they found no evidence of a supermassive black hole, nor did they find a difference in the ages. So it looks like all three ideas were right. As far as globular clusters go, the Milky Way has about 154. 
other galaxies have up to or greater than 10,000. This galaxy, it's, uh, this, uh, I'm sorry, this cluster itself is over 12 billion years old um, with a mass of over 800,000 sun-sized stars and a core diameter of 13 light years. Uh, it resides in the constellation Coma Berenices, and it was discovered by, first by Johann Bode in 1775. M53 is one of the more outlying glob globular clusters from the Milky Way, being about 58,000 light years from the solar system uh, that we live in. The field I'm looking at now in the sky uh, is in Virgo. Uh, Virgo is a very popular constellation at this time of year because of all the galaxies that are in Virgo. Now, the two uh, galaxies that you see here, they're kind of interesting. We've got an edge on. And over here, we have an elliptical galaxy. Let's look at the elliptical galaxy a little more closely. Elliptical galaxies are galaxies that don't have any particular, particular divine shape. They aren't spirals, they aren't barred spirals. They just look like fuzzy balls in the sky. Uh, this particular elliptical galaxy has a fairly bright central core but no defined shape. Now, the reason I wanna look at this elliptical galaxy, and by the way, this is a galaxy NGC 5018. The reason I wanna look at this galaxy is that there was or is a supernova. And that's what this blue looking star is off to the side of the galaxy. Although it looks like it's separate from the galaxy, it is still in that galaxy. It's just in some of the outer reaches of that galaxy that are a little more difficult to see. But that galaxy does extend way out. And this is a star in the outer reaches of that galaxy. This star went supernova on March 17th of this year. And it was spotted not by an automated system like many galaxy or supernovas are, it was spotted by a Japanese astronomer by the name of Koichi Itagaki. It's 130 million years uh, or light years distant. And it's shining at the mag at magnitude 14. So that is a star, one single star that you can see from 130 million light years distance. Like most supernovas, supernovas, it's a type 1a supernova where a binary star system composed of a white dwarf and a giant secondary, usually a red giant, is accreting mass from the red giant onto the white dwarf. And when the mass reaches a certain limit, when it's sucked in enough of the, the red giant star, it reaches the carbon fusion point and explodes with an enormous output of energy across the entire electromagnetic spectrum, including visible light. Type 1a supernova are typically used as standard candles to determine distance. They can be used to uh, determine the distance of, of a very, very distant galaxy. If it's spotted at an early stage, the light output of type 1a supernovas are very consistent. 
when they explode, they almost always explode with the same amount of light. So by measuring the amplitude of that light, how dim it is, they can determine how far away it is and therefore how far away that galaxy is. So there's hope for us amateur and uh, astronomers yet in that there are still objects to look for that haven't been discovered. And this is one of the examples. If you, if you catch it early, uh, you can be um, uh, honored in your name as the discoverer. This object is Messier number 63, known as the Sunflower Galaxy. It's located in the constellation Canis Venetici. It was actually the first discovery of Charles Messier's friend, uh, Pierre Machin. He saw this on June 14, 1779, and uh, immediately Charles Messier added it as the 63rd object in his catalog. It's one of the earliest recognized spiral galaxies um, listed by Lossi as 14 spiral nebula known up to the 1850 time frame. Now, one thing you need to understand about the discovery of galaxies is back at the time of Charles Messier, they did not understand that these objects were galaxies. They referred to them as nebulas. Uh, even the great Andromeda galaxy was referred to as the Andromeda Nebula. And because their, their optical instruments just couldn't re refine enough detail to be able to see the true structure that was there. It wasn't until the uh, uh, invent creation of the Mount Wilson telescope in the 20th century that the nature of these objects was truly understood to be, to be galaxies. Messier 63 um, has you know, very definitive spiral arms, lots of them. You can see some, some detail in this image. You can see some detail of all the arms coming out of that galaxy. It's rather a, a very pretty, pretty galaxy to, to, to photograph. It did have a supernova in it in, uh, back in, uh, discovered in uh, May 25th of 1971. Uh, was measured to reach a magnitude of 11.8. So that was studied back at the time. Um, M63 is about 37 million light years away. And it's a diameter of about 90,000 light years. So it's a fairly large uh, spiral galaxy. Um, it's in our sky, it's about six degrees south of the Whirlpool galaxy, which is a, a M51. But it's part of a of galaxies in that area um, that are known as the M51 group. The object I've got on the screen there is called a planetary nebula. In this case, this is M97, Messier object 97, the owl nebula, because of the looks of those eyes in the middle of it. Nebula is Greek for cloud, and so there's uh, four or five different ways you can describe clouds and they are different kinds of objects. In this kind of uh, cloud, it's a planetary nebula, which means that was the end of the life of a star that was um, as big as seven to eight times as big as our sun or down to as small as our sun. What happens in that kind of end of life is that the hydrogen in the star is consumed from the inside out. When about 75% of the hydrogen gets used, the nuclear reactions aren't strong enough anymore to stop gravity from collapsing the star. So gravity starts, uh, the gravity starts to win, it starts pulling the cloud in. Because what it's been doing is it's been turn turning the hydrogen into helium for many billion years, uh, somewhere around nine to 12 billion years, depending on how, what the size of the, of the uh, average size star was. So now all that helium is sitting there like campfire ashes. And when the star starts to collapse from the gravity of that helium pulling it together, it gets into a new fusion reaction. 
the helium starts to fuse and first it starts making carbon and then later it starts combining the carbon, the helium and some of the free protons running around in there combined to make oxygen. So that means you've got now what was uh, a ball of helium, turn, uh, hydrogen turning into helium. It's now in the inner part turning into carbon and oxygen. That extra energy is what causes the end of life of a star to have it expand. It expands very much. Our sun, when our sun gets to this state, it will expand about to the orbit of the earth. Uh, so it gets to be pretty big, but if it gets that big, it gets cold. Even though those nuclear reactions are going on, that mass has been spread out over such a huge volume that temperature drops. So our, our sun, has a surface temperature, the visible surface that you see from the Earth, of about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, it'll drop to about 3,200 degrees Fahrenheit when it gets that big. And then it starts sneezing off its outer gases. It doesn't have a catastrophic explosion like supernova if it was bigger. So this object that's on the right-hand side of the screen there uh, formed uh, when the gases were running away, and the gases can run away, but what can't run away is the carbon. It stays back there and it becomes a white dwarf, in effect, a space diamond. And so that white dwarf is so hot that its energy is coming off in ultraviolet radiation. And that causes the helium, hydrogen, and oxygen running away, it causes it almost to become a neon sign. It causes the hydrogen to lose an, uh, an electron and come back and uh, give off a red photon. And it causes the uh, oxygen to give off two uh, electrons and take two other ones back and it becomes blue green. So um, what we could have if we had uh, a pristine enough camera and I would actually image this for a couple of hours see an outer red band around this like a wrapper and the center part is blue green and the, I on my monitor I can see a little bit of bluish green in the middle that's the oxygen the hydrogen went away first and then the oxygen's kept, kept catching up to it the interesting re, uh, thing is those two eyes the dust balls that are in there that's other debris that came out of the sun with it and so it ends up looking like eyes in an owl. And so just like the Eskimo Nebula sort of looked like it was wearing a parka, here it looks like we've got an owl head staring back at us. This object is galaxy M83. It's also known as NGC 5236. As you could tell, this is a huge spiral galaxy in the constellation Hydra. It's also known as the Southern Pinwheel Galaxy. That's to differentiate it from the Northern Pinwheel Galaxy uh, because it, it has a very similar appearance. This galaxy is only 14 million light years away, only. I know that's still an enormous distance, but from the standpoint of galaxies, this is one, this one is relatively close by. Uh, as you are, I'm sure aware, our closest neighbor, the Andromeda galaxy is two and a half million light years. Now, being 14 million light years distance, you would think it might be part of what we call our local group, the galaxies that make up the group that we and the Andromeda galaxy go, go through the universe with. However, it's not part of the local group. It's part of what's called the Centaurus M83 group, which is a close by group uh, to uh, our local group. This was discovered in 1752. 
And the interesting thing of this galaxy is that there's lots of new star formation. If you look closely at the spiral arms, you'll notice there's lots of little bright globs within the spiral arms. Those aren't stars, those are areas within those spiral arms where there's vast numbers of new stars being born. So this is what's called an active galaxy. There's a lot of new star growth uh, happening within this galaxy. Thousands of new stars are being, uh, being born. You'll notice also that this is a barred spiral. They call it a barred spiral because radiating from the center what is what appears to be like a bar and the arms tend to rotate off of the tips of the bars. So this is M83, the Southern Pinwheel Galaxy in Hydra. The bright object in the center of the frame here is Messier object 85. It's a lenticular galaxy located in Coma Berenices. It's one of the brightest members of the Coma Virgo, Virgo cluster of galaxies. It's, it's very bright. It was discovered in 1781 by uh, Pierre Machane uh, and confirmed the same year by Charles Messier and added to his catalog as object number 85. It uh, is about uh, 58 million light years away with a diameter of about 116,000 light years. So it's, it's a large lenticular galaxy. Now you'll also notice below it, you'll see another smudge down there. And that is a possible companion galaxy to it, they're, they're not quite sure if it is or it isn't because it's quite a bit further away. That companion is 81 million light years away and it's about 81,000 light years across. So it looks smaller and it is a little bit smaller but it's also further away than, than M85. And that line you're seeing crossing through the frame, that is a satellite track that went through one of my frames. That's what happens when a satellite goes, goes past your telescope. Also, uh, with uh, M85, there was a supernova discovered in it back in uh, 1960, and that was observed. And it reached up to magnitude 11.7. This item is called the Whirlpool Galaxy. It's uh, another Messier item, uh, Messier item number 51. And he found it on October 13th, 1773. Um, as we can see now, it's what's called a, um, an interacting grand design spiral galaxy with an active galactic. Uh, nucleus. The, there's a star forming going on on both of those two galaxies in the nucleus uh, right now. And the uh, interesting thing was that the large galaxy was found in 1773 by Messier, but the other uh, component, NGC 5195, wasn't discovered until uh, 1781 by his partner, Pierre Machine. Uh, they have interacted, as you can see on the right-hand side, it's almost like, for those of you who are old enough to remember it, a VCR tape. There is a stream of debris going down the right-hand side uh, of the picture. And if you look at the structure of the whirlpool itself, 
you can see that it is not perfectly round. And that is because about 25 million years ago or so, uh, the small galaxy came, uh, was pulled by the uh, gravity of the large galaxy from up off the top of the screen and came towards it. But it missed it. It didn't collide with it. It went underneath it. But on when it went under and right under the nucleus, it actually flattened the uh, uh, pairs. Sev several of the arms are flatter. They're not round due to the gravity of that uh, the smaller galaxy going underneath it. Um, it's about three quarters the size of our Milky Way. It's about 75,000 or so light years across for the main, gal uh, the main uh, galaxy in that pair. And the interesting thing is there's a lot of space in it. It might be three quarters the size of the Milky Way, but it's only got 11% of the mass. So it's only got one tenth of the mass of our Milky Way, but it's three fourths big. So this is the famous Sombrero Galaxy uh, in the constellation Virgo. It's also known as M104, one of um, the last of Messier's objects that aren't comets. Sombrero Galaxy is uh, probably one of the one of the most photographed um, and widely used images of galaxies uh, because of its uh, beautiful shape uh, and appearance. Uh, you probably may have seen it at the end of the credits on the old Twilight Zone films. Uh, those of us who uh, remember the old Twilight Zone series. There's a, a beautiful dust lane that cuts through the outer edges of the galaxy uh, and blocks the light. Uh, in such a way that it bisects uh, the galaxy. And uh, we aren't looking at it completely edge on. Uh, it's probably tilted towards us about, oh, I don't know, 70, 80 degrees. So we see the, the top face much more clearly than the bottom face. Uh, but you can see the, the, the glow of the, uh, the central core on the bottom as well as uh, the much brighter glow uh, on the top. So this is the, the beautiful Sombrero Galaxy. All right, everybody. Well, thank you for uh, watching our virtual star party. We uh, enjoy putting them on probably, uh, hopefully as much as you enjoy watching them. Um, we had a good wide variety of objects to be able to uh, show you um, under some dark, uh, good Arizona sky. So that's really cool. And uh, hopefully you were able to learn a little bit about astronomy. So what I want to do now is uh, just kind of go around the horn with each of the astronomers and give them a minute or so to uh, wrap things up. So we'll start with Bernie. Well, thank you, Jim. And um... I hope everyone uh, enjoyed our enjoyed our little presentation here. Uh, we've uh, tried to uh, simulate the uh, Grand Canyon Star Party as best we can. Um, I know uh, that uh, a lot of people are are disappointed that they couldn't make it, but uh, this year. But we're all looking forward to next year, and hopefully we'll have it uh, uh, in person again and back how we used to do it. And this is Rick Paul. I want to thank everyone for, for joining us tonight for this. Uh, it was a lot of fun for us. Uh, we always uh, learn things too when we do this. Uh, and the one thing I always like to encourage people to do is go outside at night and look up. Uh, if you own a pair of binoculars, take them outside and uh, look up. I think you'll be surprised at what you can see on your own. And I'm Jim O'Connor, and this is so much fun to be able to get together and pull a lot of astronomy together and try to help all of you get introduced to your home universe. There's a lot of things out there 
that are wonderful to look at and to contemplate. So if you ever get a chance, get out under the night sky and look up. And any of the stories of the constellations you may have heard, make up your own. There's no one right way to look at the sky. It's all just beautiful and it's all just out there for us to uh, be able to bring us a little bit of peace, a little bit of a little bit of happiness, a little bit of uh, finding our way around the world. So thanks for uh, tuning in to watch uh, this event. And we hope to see you again at the next time.